So welcome to our webinar, Creating a, a Triathlon Nutrition and Hydration Plan with David Glover and Krista Schultz. So um, just some quick introductions. So I'm David and um, I'd like to introduce Krista. So uh, Krista is not only my wife, but she's also an accomplished triathlete. She's been doing triathlons for much more than a decade now and all distances from sprint to Ironman. Um, she's qualified for and raced at the Ironman World Championships in Hawaii and she was second in her age group at the inaugural and only Ironman China a few years ago. Um, she also represented the best of the U.S. for the state of Maryland for three years in a row and is a multi-USAT All-American. Um, as a coach, uh, Krista has her bachelor's degree in exercise physiology from University of New Orleans. She also has a master's in education in athletic administration from Goucher College. Um, you, prior to getting into triathlon, she worked with a number of different professional athletes and, and teams, including the Baltimore Ravens, the Baltimore Orioles, and the New Orleans Brass. She is the founder of She Does Try, which helps is a, um, so she does try.com. Uh, his purpose is to help women build confident, confidence through triathlon and other endurance sports. Uh, Krista frequently presents and speaks around Boulder, where we live, and uh, she and I also put on these series of webinars that we do each spring. Krista? Thank you for that nice intro, David. David is, um, I'll, I'll just do a quick in introduction, he's accomplished quite a bit here, but um, one of the things I like to point out is he's a cancer survivor and he's written a great book um, titled Full Time in Sub-9 about racing and, and life in general and uh, surviving cancer. He was a graduate, uh, he's a graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy and he has a, two master's degrees. One of them is in exercise physiology and he's certified by USA Triathlon and Cycling and a strength and conditioning specialist. David's done quite a few Ironmans. He's got 28 behind his belt, and his personal best is at 851. He raced as a pro triathlete, and he was inducted in the Vineman um, Ironman Hall of Fame. And he also got into, um, after racing professionally in triathlon, he got into doing the Spart Spartan racing and placed in the top 20 at the uh, Spartan Race Ultra Beast. And one more thing to point out, he was a, um, he's a founder of the Luray Triathlons in, um, in Luray, Virginia. Thank you, Krista. So why are we here, to, why are we here today? And, um, and thank you for all of you who are able to join us. And, you know, this is really the question. So why do we, why do we even care? Why, why are we even concerned with nutrition and hydration? And when I think about, um, you know, going through my master's in exercise physiology and talking about, you know, different topics. Um, probably, you know, the, the three topics I enjoyed the most, one was um, nutrition, and then uh, the others were, uh, you know, psychology, sports psychology, and the uh, energy systems. But um, so this is near and near dear to me, um, especially as a, an Ironman distance triathlete. So why do we care? We, we care because, one, we need to provide fuel to our muscles. So as we're working out, our muscles need a fuel source in order to move and so when our muscles uh, tighten and move that allows our bodies to move. Um, fueling properly and hydrating helps us resist fatigue. Um, hydrating especially will help prevent overheating. Um, so as you're out there sweating, um, you're giving up, giving away water in the form of sweat um, so you, you need to be able to replace that. Um, maintain water and sodium levels. So again, you think about all the chemical reactions that go on inside our body, a lot of them are, are dependent on water and then um, sodium levels as well, especially when it comes to things like muscle contractions. And feeling good. So if we're, you know, if you've ever gone out on a ride and, you know, a long ride or done a long race and run out of fuel, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel so well. So we, we want to basically accomplish all these things. And so why create a plan? You know, and, and ironically enough, you know, when I look at the, you know, over the years of, you know, I've, I've been doing this sport for 20 years now, um, 
this is actually one of the, the areas where I think people, a lot of people fell short of their potential, especially as they get into longer races because uh, they don't have a plan. They haven't taken the time to write something down, practice it, and learn from it. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight, the agenda, um, we're going to start with sort of what's going on. So what's going on with your body? Um, you know, why, wh why do we need carbohydrates and maybe not fats? Um, you know, why do we need water? And you know, we'll talk a little bit about electrolytes as well. Um, the second thing is uh, developing your plan. So we're going to give guidelines. So these are actually going to be all research-based guidelines, um, pulling from a number of different studies. We'll give you, uh, we went out today and took some, a picture of the back of uh, um, some, some of the nutrition products we have at home. Um, so we can talk about those and going to go through the pros and cons of those. So looking at some specific product examples and then sort of give you an idea of what a, a plan looks like, um, which is basically the plan, plan I've, I've used. Um, talk about training, so, you know, how you implement this and how you practice it, and, and, and finally uh, implementing on race day. Yeah, and try to take some good notes and really focus in on things um, that will help you in particular. This is a really important topic, and it typically makes or breaks an athlete, especially when you get into these longer distance events. Yeah, and the focus today, again, is, is nutrition and hydration around training and racing. So we're talking about the time period just before, during, and just after. Um, we do have a webinar coming up in two weeks um, that's going to get more into general day-to-day -day healthy eating. Um, so this, again, is just fo we'll focus more on, you know, per performance um, eating and drinking. Um, so here's an, you know, basically this is what we're trying to get to. Um, here's an example of the plan I've used um, for my Ironman distance races. And, you know, you can see I've kind of broken it down by a swim, bike, and run. And then I've got some, some guidelines. I, I don't have specific products listed um, because it, it will depend on, on the course. So depending on the course, um, most of the time, you know, I'll use what's available. Um, but I may bring my own stuff. But that's all stuff we'll talk about. And um, this is just to give you sort of a preview of where we're trying to get to. The disclaimer, and, you know, this is where, you know, we can share the science with you and, and give you some guidelines that are, you know, kind of pulled from a number of different research studies. Um, but keep in mind that all this is highly individual. Um, so what works for me, what works for Krista, um, may not work for you. And there's a number of factors involved. And we'll go through some of those. So even having your plan dialed in, um, you know, for example, you know, if I'm doing a, you know, a race in um, Virginia, it's humid, humid it's hot. Um, my nutrition hydration needs may be different than if I do it in Boulder, uh, which is also hot but typically dry in an elevation. So other factors come into play. So there is, there is going to be some trial and error. And so the, the key here, in, as you see in the second sentence, is really you have to practice, practice, practice. Um, the, the challenge being, um, especially as you get into longer races, is uh, a couple of the questions um, that you, you all submitted beforehand, it is really hard to practice, you know, especially for like an Ironman or a marathon in training because you're not typically doing those events as part, in full as part of your training. So there is, there is some... You know, some learning that you, you, you I mean, basically you'll have to do um, via the event itself. Um, and then finally, you know, if there are some nutritional challenges you can't resolve, you may have to find a, um, a professional who can sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and figure out what you need. Yeah, and practicing is key here, which we'll get into, but you learn to assimilate products and um, certain amounts of fluids and calories and electrolytes through your training. So. If you are getting ready for some of these longer distance events now and ramping up your volume, this is a good point to start writing things down, planning them out, and implementing them. And that's where I think a lot of athletes uh, fall short, is that implementation piece. Um, so what's going on? In you know, I always think, um, I mean, it's easy to jump to the how, you know, like this is what you need to do. Um, but I, I really, for anything, I, I really started like to start with the why. So this is kind of what we're 
we're getting at is, okay, what, what's going on in your body? Why, why do we need to, to do these things? And, you know, let's start with carbohydrates. And I, I use this slide a lot. Um, but basically, we, we talk about available fuel sources to the body. There, there's really three. There's fats, there's proteins, and there's carbohydrates. And of the three, the easiest to break down are carbohydrates. Um, it's just it's a faster process. Um, so if the body needs fuel quickly, uh, it's going to rely more heavily on carbohydrates. So what this means, if you look at this chart, basically what the pie chart is showing is for a sample 70 kilograms, so roughly 155 pound male, what, how many calories are available to that individual at the start of an event? So roughly 71,000 calories of fat, 24,000 calories of protein, and, and set only 1,700 calories of carbohydrate. Um, so what this clearly shows is carbohydrate, the, our bodies just don't store as much of it as the others. Um, and you can further break down carbohydrates and whether it's stored in the muscle, the liver, or, or it, actually in the, in, the, in the blood itself. Um, and, you know, if you, what I said a little few mi a minute ago, carbohydrates are the more, most accessible. So if we, the faster we go, the more we have to rely on carbohydrates. Um, you know, and if, if you've ever done estimates for running or biking and, you know, how many calories per hour, um, you, you know, depending on your speed, I mean, biking, you could burn anywhere from 300 calories an hour to you know, if you're doing an, an hour all out effort, you may be a thousand calories per hour. So really limited in carbohydrates. So the bottom line is we, we, we can't actually run out or nearly run out. So that's something we want to avoid. Um, again, you know, protein is available as a fuel source. Don't really want to use it. You think of it as sort of the, the structural, the building blocks of the body. Um, if we're burning proteins, typically it's because we're running low on carbohydrates. Um, fat, you know, fat burning is great. You know, it's, if, if you're out walking, you can burn fat, fats all day because that's a, not demanding a lot of um, energy. But, you know, as again, as you go faster and faster, your body just cannot break down fats fast enough to supply energy to the muscle, so that, that energy is going to have to come from carbohydrates. Um, so running low on glycogen or carbohydrates, so the glycogen is the, the body's, um, how it stores carbohydrate, um, is basically, you've probably heard the term or may, hopefully, um, I should say experienced it because it's good to know what it feels like. It's, it's not good to do it during a race. But sort of um, conceptually, if you look on the left, what happens if you think of the green, the full green box as, your, as a fuel tank and it's full of fuel, as you exercise um, from you going from the pre-workout to post-workout, you're going to use up some of that fuel. So your tank's a little under half full here. Um, on the right, um, if I only start with part of a tank and if I burn through the same amount of calories, you know, as you can see on the right, I, I can actually run pretty low and, and experience a bonk. I have a quick little story. This morning I had a, a client in my cycling class, and we were just talking about replacing glycogen stores, and she mentioned an athlete she knew that had, I'd, I'd never heard it called this before, but had done hypoglycemic training, and she explained that meant he didn't eat before workouts. So he didn't replace his glycogen stores or top them off or anything and went into these long, heavy workouts. So gradually, I guess what happened to his body, she explained that he actually developed hypoglycemia. So he almost became like a diabetic um, in that sense, that he gets really low blood sugar all the time. So I thought that was sort of interesting what happened. He had trained his body um, to be like that all the time, basically. So it can affect other things when we create these imbalances in our body long enough and extreme enough. So the whole idea is that we maintain a balance. And when you are exercising, if you don't have your preferred fuel source and you're going hard and pushing past those limits, you know, your body is going to suffer in some way because it has to draw from you know, protein synthesis, breaks down muscle mass. Um, and there is some theories around not eating and training. But again, I'd be really careful with some of those ideas about accelerating fat burning and, 
try to, you know, be smart about the intensities and durations if you, you're not going to eat. Um, maybe cut back on those kind of things. Yeah, and I, I just, a real quick aside, I, I when I was, I, I didn't, my third year of racing, I, I, a friend had talked me into doing Ironman Canada, and we did our first, like, long brick, and it was basically, a, I think it was like a 60-mile ride, and then we did like a 12-mile run afterwards, and it was in the middle of, like, probably like May, I'm getting May, June in Virginia, so pretty hot and humid, and I remember, like, going out on the bike ride, I think I had like two bottles of water and like two gels, and you know, for a three and a half hour ride and, you know, it didn't really bring enough, but I, you know, at the time I was like, oh, I'm fine. And then we start the run, we're doing out, you know, six miles out, six miles back on the, the WNOD trail. And I remember, you know, just taking off, like, I'll, you know, I feel fine. And, you know, my friends like, you know, you need to, you need to slow down. You need to take in some calories. I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. And, you know, that, that lasted for about the first four or five miles. And, um, as I slowly, um, you know, I kind of think of it as like death by a thousand paper cuts as just, you just slowly start to slow down. And, um, it, and the interesting thing about bonking, there's physical, I mean, you just, you, you slow down because your body's just not producing enough carbohydrate. Um, you know, you, so you can't go any faster, um, but it also affects you mentally. And, um, you, you start to kind of, I wouldn't say quite hallucinate, but it feels like you're kind of losing, losing touch a little bit with reality. So, um, you know, being your, that your brain uses carbohydrate as a fuel source, it, you know, it can definitely affect your, your thinking too. Um, so. But, you know, if you do, if you have experienced it, I, I think it's good to know what it feels like, um, just so you can sort of recognize the symptoms. So, um, hydration, um, you know, I think the chart is pretty self-explanatory. So, so most of our body is water. Um, if we look at muscles, you know, even more so, and in, in blood even more so. So, you know, if we re reduce the percentage of water in muscles, um, I think the analogy, you, you have a good analogy for that. For, oh, uh, yeah, I use the analogy of a sponge. So if a sponge is really dry, it's sort of brittle and hard and it cracks easier. And if it's, you know, saturated with water, it's, it's a lot more pliable and moves, you know, with through, through range without snapping. So I use that as an analogy to the muscles because it's um, sort of hydrous tissue. Yeah, and blood, you can think about, you know, your, your heart's pumping blood. If you're losing water from your blood, it's becoming thicker, so it's, it be, it's almost like pumping sludge. Your body has to work that much harder. Um, and then you become dehydrated, it in, impacts all these things. So muscle function, um, blood viscosity, so how, how thick it is. Uh, perceived effort, so you, 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 it feels harder. Um, your body's, it, you know, not able to cool itself as well. So if you, you know, if you don't have enough water in your body, you're gonna, you're gonna inhibit your ability to sweat, and then also it impacts your potential for uh, gastrointestinal distress. Um, the other extreme is drinking too much water. Um, there's a, it, it's actually been a lot of publicity around this over the years, uh, hyponatremium, so basically low concentrations of sodium in your blood. Um, so if you think about, you know, if you took um, like a, a, a gallon of seawater and, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's got a lot of sodium in it, um, but if you added, you know, another gallon of plain water, it would get really diluted and, and basically that's what's happening to your, to your, to your blood. Um, this is, uh, you know, at the bottom it says at risk. So people that sweat a lot and then uh, slower athletes in longer events. So there's a, a tendency to drink too much. And so that's it's something, you know, to, to be aware of. Um, and then some of the symptoms, um, you know, n no fun. And this is potentially uh, pretty, pretty dangerous as well. As well. Um, so key point here is it is important to take in electrolytes, especially sodium, um, but also not, not to over drink. Yeah, I actually had a client who had hyponatremia. Um, she did Ironman, and she was, a after the race, she got um, an IV because she had gotten sick and lost a lot of fluids during the race. And then later on throughout the day, she kept guzzling water. And then what happened was she dil diluted all that, um, the sodium serum concentration. So she, um, she basically, I think she ended up doing some long-term damage uh, because it 
probably the the doctor said it probably had happened in the past and she would just drink too much water without enough sodium and she'd get a lot of swelling so I've, I've heard people a lot of times they say well you have too much sodium but it's not about that it's more about the balance of of sodium to fluid so her balance was way off you know she was swelling potentially um, and they're doing some you know medical testing just really stretch the cell walls so when she goes to absorb fluid she has to now just take tiny sips of water and can't guzzle and make sure she has electrolytes so it's a very serious thing and I think a lot of times we get confused on oh and you know what do I do or what don't I do so we're gonna provide guidelines yeah, and in the first symptom, uh, rapid weight gain, so that's actually something you can measure. So if you, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, is as far as weighing yourself before and after uh, your longer workouts and um, your races, um, just to see how, how much you know, water you lost or gained. Um, and then finally, the, the, the final factor that's really important to consider is basically your, your gastrointestinal system. So if you're swallowing... Um, stuff and it goes into your, your stomach and into your, your small intestine. Um, it's getting absorbed there into your, into your blood. Um, what research has shown is that the GI problems, so you know, feeling bloated, um, upset stomach. I, I know for a number of years, I, I, you know, when I was doing Ironman races, I, was, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was just taking in too many carbohydrates. Um, so about 85 miles into the bike, I would, you know, my stomach would get upset enough, I'd throw it up, and then, you know, I'd feel better because I it cleared out. Um, so some of the things that cause GI problems, uh, fiber, um, fat, protein, and concentrated carbohydrates. Um, so there's a lot of controversy around some of these things, you know, as far as whether or not to take them during exercise. Um, the way I, I like to think about it is the faster you're going, you know, the more demand there is on your body and the harder it is for your body to absorb stuff. So the, the, the easier you can make it by taking in carbohydrates, which are the least, um, or the, I'm sorry, the, the most likely to be absorbed, so they're the, the easiest to absorb, um, the, the easier it is for your body. And, you know, for some of these things, I mean, sure, if you're, if you're walking a marathon, then you can, you know, pretty much eat whatever you want because the demands on your body are low enough that your body can absorb these other things. But, you know, as you become faster, more competitive, um, these are some of the things you may have to watch out for. And, again, you know, e each person is going to be a little bit different. Um, other factors, um, age, sex, uh, heat, um, conditioning, intensity, and stress. Um, so we've kind of gone into the why, and let's talk about the what. And, you know, it's really – you know, starting with what are, what are you trying to accomplish? So how, how long will you be exercising? Um, you know, this is the athlete guide from Ironman 70.3 Raleigh, the cover. Um, you know, if you're doing a half Ironman, a marathon, you know, even a shorter race, um, it's going to, and we'll go into some guidelines in the next couple slides, but it, it, it's going to drive your strategy in each distance. So if you're doing a two-hour race versus a 12-, 14-hour race, it's going to be different. Um, so what's available to you? So if you're, you know, if I'm doing Raleigh, for example, I want to read the athlete guide and figure out, okay, what, what, what are they going to serve in the aid stations? You know, where are the aid stations? You know, how many are on the bike? How many are on the run? What can I expect there? Um, you know, and is it enough? Is it enough to just pick up from the aid stations or do I need to bring my own stuff? Do I like what's on the aid stations? If, if not, then I may have to bring my own stuff. Um, and that gets to the last question. So what works for you? What doesn't work for you? And then finally, you know, write, write down your plan and practice it. So carbohydrate intake guidelines. Um, I came across this slide. Um, this is actually uh, Asker Jugendrup. I'm, I may be mispronouncing his last name. Um, he's a British researcher. He's also a triathlete, and he, he's done a number of, different studies on, on triathlon and sports nutrition. And this is a review um, just last year. He, he looked at a lot of the research out there and kind of came up with, with these guidelines. And um, you know, I put the source at the bottom, but if you get a chance, uh, you can Google it and find it and read through it because it kind of goes into and it, it does a lot of ex ex explaining, um, which is helpful. 
So how, how he breaks it down based on what the research shows is by duration of exercise. So if, if I look on the left hand side, it, it's broken into blocks of 30 to 75 minutes, you know, one to two hours, two to three hours, or greater than, than two and a half hours. Um, the amount of carbohydrate needed, the recommended type, and then additional recommendations. So um, to start with a shorter example, you know, in, in general, you, you really don't need a lot of calories because um, in the example person we gave, he has roughly 1,700 calories um, available. So it, it's really, it would be really hard for him to run out, you know, any, in anything, uh, you know, under an hour. Um, however, research has shown that a small amount, um, you know, just the taste of it, um, can actually impact in performance. Um, as you get into one to two hours, um, again, you don't need to replace all of it, but you know, replacing some of it, so 30 grams per hour. Um, a, a key thing to remember is there's roughly four calories per gram of carbohydrate, so roughly 120 calories per hour um, is a good target for the one to two hours. So probably not going to run out of what you have at the start, but you're also sort of supplementing that. Um, two to three hours, that increases, and then up to two, you know, greater than two and a half hours, that increases more. And when they looked at the research for the athletes, they found it, it didn't vary so much by size as far as what could be absorbed, but really it was a limitation to how much your gut can take in at any time. Um, so these are rough guidelines to start with. So if, you know, if I break it down into calories, you know, one to two hours is 120 calories per hour, two to three is you know, 240 and greater than two and a half is, is 360. Um, that's going to change, you know, based on, on the athlete. So if you're a smaller athlete, you wouldn't need as much. You know, a, a bigger athlete, um, you're going to probably need that, that full amount. Um, the second column, it talks about types of carbohydrate. So we look at different types of carbohydrates. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, a, a simple level, you know, if you think about, um, you know, sucrose or, or glucose, I'm sorry, there's uh, dextrose or glucose, um, glucose is basically what your, your body uh, can readily absorb, so your muscles. Uh, there's fructose, which is f uh, fruit sugar, and uh, galactose. Um, there's also, you kind of take a step up from the simple sugars um, to the, the, the disaccharide. So they, you know, like a sucrose, for example, has a glucose and fructose. So what, what, all, what, all, what all I'm getting at is, um, you know, for a, simple, for a single type of sugar, um, so dextrose or glucose, for example, your body is really limited to absorbing about 60 grams per hour. Um, anything above that, it, you know, it's just going to kind of back up in your gut. Um, so the way you get to that 90 grams or more than 60 is to take in different types of su sugar. Um, so, for example, um, a sucrose or table sugar um, is both glucose and fructose. Um, so that, you know, because there are two different types of sugar, they're absorbed a little bit differently. Your body can take in a little bit more than just one or the other. I was, I was doing a talk last night, and I had a couple of products out. We were talking about smart, safe training. And I was just kind of joking around. I make a little cocktail when I train, and I like to mix. Like David was saying, if you have a product like heat, it's got maltodextrin, which is multiple chains of glucose, so it's a complex carbohydrate. And then I like to mix some scratch labs in there. It's got dextrose and I think it's dextrose and sucrose. And it's got some good, a good amount of uh, sodium in it as well. So I kind of, you know, put a little of that in. So I know after I maxed out on glucose or maltodextrin absorption, I'm going to absorb that dex dextrose. Or I maxed out on carbohydrate absorption, I'll, I'll absorb some of the other sugars because they're different. And that's the main thing they're getting at here is sports drinks, um, you know, you can absorb a certain amount and there's a certain amount recommended, but um, this, this uh, you know, single multiple uh, carbohydrate type is just different types of sugar. Okay, um, so some guidelines for hydration and electrolyte replacement. Um, so hydration, so a modest sweat rate is 32 ounces per hour, you know, maybe more or less depending on the condition. Um, 
you know, general guidelines are, are to replace 90% during exercise. So, you know, you may not be able to replace everything. Um, again, you know, similar to carbohydrates, the faster you're going, the more your body's heated up, the more it's going to sweat. So the more um, liquid you're going to lose, the harder it is to, to, to replace it. Um, electrolytes, uh, American College of Sports Med Medicine recommends 500 to 700 milligrams of sodium per every 32 ounces of water. So, you know, every, you know, water bottle is typically 16 or 24 ounces, depending on the size. So you're roughly looking at, you know, 500, 4 to 500 milligrams of sodium, you know, per water bottle. Um, however, you may need more if you sweat a lot, um, experience cramping. Um, cramping is interesting because it's it, it's hard. It may be hard to nail down what's causing it. Um, some of it could be dehydration. Some of it could be electrolyte balance off. Um, some of it could be fatigue. Um, and finally, if you notice uh, swelling in hands and feet. Um, so if you go back to we were talking about hyponatremia, that, that was one of the, uh, the symptoms. So taking in too much water and throwing off your sodium balance. Um, it, if you look at the guy on the right, um, this is from Ironman Boulder. Um, it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but there, he's actually pretty much caked in, in salt. Um, so he's, he's you know, pretty big athlete, sweating a lot, so he's probably going to need more than 700 milligrams of sodium. Yeah, and uh, I was talking to a friend the other day, and he started doing some sweat testing at a facility that he owns, and he was blown away, he told me, by some of the – they tested some pro triathletes, and – measured the amount of sodium and fluid they were losing while they were exercising. And you said, wow, I'm, I'm really amazed how much sodium loss these athletes have. It's, it's more than um, I ever thought or they even thought. And uh, these recommendations are really good. I, I've heard some people say, well, that's too much. Or there is some, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the Internet. A lot of different companies put out different um, pieces of information. But I think we're – we're all coming to understand that we just need to maintain a balance. So if, you know, you lose a certain amount of, of fluid through your sweat and sodium goes along with that, we want to replace that because that sodium is important to help that fluid just get absorbed into the tissue. Um, so what you need, so you, you, the individual athlete, um, may vary. So some of the key factors to consider, so body mass. Um, so this is my friend Mike. He's, he's a, about a 220-pound Clydesdale. Um, so his calorie needs are, are probably going to be much greater than someone like Krista, who's about 125 pounds. Um, so, you know, going back to those guidelines of, you know, 60 grams per hour for two to three hours and, you know, 90 grams for, you know, greater than two and a half or three, um, he's going to be on the high end of that and maybe a little bit more. Um, intensity of effort, so this is sort of the, uh, the paradox. Um, as you increase effort, you're burning more calories, um, but it's also more challenging to digest stuff. So um, you, you know, there's a couple you know, questions related to biking and running. So you know, generally speaking, on the bike, we're able to take in more calories because we're sitting down and our stomach's not jostling around. You know, as you go to run, it may be harder to, you know, take in solids or as many calories. Um, duration of the event, um, so, you know, for the guidelines on the previous slide, you know, if you're doing a real short event, you really don't need much. Um, but as you go into those longer races, especially as you get up into the half Ironmans, marathons, and marathons, um, you're going to need, you know, more calories um, and more fluid as well. Um, fitness, um, generally, you know, the more fit you are, you know, the more adaptable your, your, your body's going to be. So, um, you know, that may be a factor as well. Um, tolerance um, is a saying, you know, train your gut. So, get, you know, the more you practice and get used to it, the easier it is. So, um, you know, if you don't practice and you go out and get throw yourself in the middle of race day and take in a lot of gels, you just you may, just may not be able to digest them. And then finally, temperature. Um, Temperature is interesting. I mean, from the obvious reason, uh, if, if it's hotter, um, I should say temperature slash weather. If it's hotter, more humid, you're gonna, you know, or even you know, humidity. That, that's all gonna affect your your sweat rate and your body's ability to cool itself. Um, the other thing you'll find is as it gets warmer, it may be harder to 
or you may be less likely to want to eat stuff as well. So it's just something to be aware of. Yeah, and, you know, there are some people that don't fall within the norm. I was talking to a client the other day, and she said, oh, I, you know, train with my boyfriend, and he only drinks water, and he does really well. Um, so, I mean, they're doing shorter distance stuff and, you know, eating and hydrating around their workouts. But he, you know, he and, and there's a couple other people I know can get away with that to a certain extent. Most of us, even professional triathletes that are very efficient, I remember doing some metabolic testing on some professional triathletes and determining caloric expenditure and even just trying to replace a portion of what they're burning. We had, you know, some, some of the guys like 400 calories an hour, and if they weren't getting that at minimum, they said, yeah, I'd really fall off. So, you know, just um, taking into account all these things, but also remembering everybody's a little different too. So when you start to implement some of these guidelines, we talked about sodium and we'll talk about, um, you know, fluid and calories a little here, that you use a little trial and error um, with that. Um, so I just, these are some of the things we have at home. On the left is hammer heed. And uh, I just pull these out uh, to give you some specific examples. So some of the things to look at is, you know, what's the serving? So one scoop, um, you know, 100 calories. So if, you know, if the guideline for a, you know, two to three hour race is, you know, 60 grams per hour, it's 240 calories per hour, um, roughly it's, you know, two and a half scoops. Um, you know, you know, gel might be 100 calories. So it, that's a way to sort of you can add up, um, you know, where your calories are coming from. Uh, if I look at the ingredients at the bottom, uh, the first ingredient is maltodextrin. Um, so as Krista said, maltodextrin is basically chains of, of glucose molecules. Um, so that's the only uh, type of carbohydrate. Um, so, you know, like, like she said, um, one thing you might consider doing if you, you can't get enough calories from the heat, um, you may not be able to absorb enough. If you're doing these longer races, you may have to supplement um, or mix in another type of sports drink that has an, another type of sugar. Um, look at some of these other things, uh, sodium, uh, 40 milligrams in a serving. Um, so the ACSM guidelines were roughly 500 to 700. Um, so hammer products tend to be a little light on the sodium. Um, and, you know, that's sort of their take on things. Um, so, it, you know, just keep in mind, just because it, it says it has electrolytes, it, it may not be enough for what you need. Uh, product, product on the right, uh, Scratch Labs, um, it's a little bit hard to read. Um, so look at this. So half a scoop. So, uh, you know, it's basically 40 calories. So if I put in a scoop, it's roughly 80 calories. So, you know, one full scoop would be comparable to the hammer. Um, I look at, you know, sodium. In this case, there's 180 milligrams. Um, so that's a lot more. So, you know, I, I would only need, you know, three half scoops to get to 540. Um, so a lot more sodium here. Um, look at the types of sugar in the ingredients. I've got cane sugar, um, which is basically sucrose, which is glucose and fructose. So we've got two types of sugar there, and then dextrose, which is glucose. So we've got basically two different types of sugars. Um, and then as you know, the research has shown, because we have two different types, we're able to observe, absorb more calories than we could if it was just one type. Um, so in some ways, th this might be a, 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 you know, a better product if you, if you need more calories, or you may need to mix and match a little bit. Yeah, and I like, like I was saying, make that little cocktail with a little bit of Scratch Labs in there because it does have a good amount of sodium. And um, a couple other products you can look at. Um, salt, salt stick tabs are great. Each, each tab is about, I think, 250 milligrams of sodium, and it has all the five electrolytes in it, but mostly the sodium. And um, th there's some other good products. Um, you know, just make, make sure you do read the labels, even if it says electrolytes. Because I had a client that did get a product, and she said, oh, you know, they told me this would be great electrolytes, and you said I needed electrolytes. And I specifically told her she needed sodium, but somehow translated that to electrolytes. And the product she got didn't have sodium in it, but had all the other electrolytes. So 
we, we want to make sure we read the labels um, and not just look at the, you know, the picture on the outside and, you know, let's see what's in that and calculate it. And uh, the one comment on uh, fructose or uh, fruit sugar, it, it, it doesn't work for everybody. So it, it's you know, just because something has more than one type of sugar, it may, it may not work for you if, if your, your body, um, you know, if it upsets, it upsets your stomach. Is there a comment? Oh, so, yeah, I mean, fructose, is, a lot of times when it's in a product, it's not really from actual fruit. It's A lot of times it's high fructose corn syrup. So that has a bunch of different names, and fructose is, is one of those. And, you know, fructose is um, processed through the liver, can cause GI distress, is, you know, a little cheaper sugar. So, so a lot of times I hear athletes have, have trouble with that, and I try to stay away from that unless they're really married to the product and have done well on it with it. Yep. Um, so, you know, th those are two sports strings. So these are uh, two electrolyte products. Um, so on the left is hammer and duralites. Again, you can kind of just look through the ingredients. Um, the key one I want to focus on is sodium. So 80 milligrams, so maybe a little light. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. So even, you know, if, if you find you know, you're, you're taking it, you may have to take a lot more of these than another product, for example, that has more. On the right are uh, noon tablets. So these are little tablets you just drop into your sports drink. Um, I look at sodium, it's got 180 milligrams. Um, so a little over twice as much. So in this case, you know, you, you wouldn't need as many of these to get, you know, whatever amount of sodium you're trying to target. Um, you know, if, again, if we're looking at that 500 to 700. Um, so we can use these types of products to sort of supplement um, what we're taking in in our sports drink. And some, you know, gels and, you know, even bars are, are going to have sodium as well. So, you know, it's, you know, I think it's good to kind of look at the labels and, and kind of add up, okay, you know, if my goal is to get, you know, for an Ironman, I mean, I, I try to get most of my calories from liquid and then, you know, supplement with gel because um, I found, you know, liquids are more easy to digest. They're going to be less concentrated. Um, so less likely to upset my stomach, um, but I need, may need to supplement um, with products like these um, to, to get to get in the um, needed electrolytes. Yeah, and Hammer Nutrition has a new Enduralite that has more sodium in it um, per capsule. So you can see this one, two capsules, um, you know, is the serving size. So it's got um, 80 milligrams of sodium for two capsules. And that would be a lot of capsules to take if you were trying to, you know, get 250 milligrams with 500 milliliters of water, um, which we were talking about earlier. It's, you know, it's about really figuring out why and when you need these products and adding up, you know, maybe what's in the, the sports drink already. Like Scratch Labs has a good amount. Um, but the new tablets are great, too, just for... Um, hydrating around your event so you're not just drinking water. Yeah, other things you look at, if you look at the noon tablets, they've um, actually got caffeine too. Um, so like for me, I'm sensitive to caffeine, so that's something I'd, I'd be aware of um, or want to be aware of so I don't overdo it um, by accident. Um, so other products, so gels, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, personally, I'm a big fan of hammer products and um, use heat and, and gels a lot. Um, so again, a, a gel is another way to get in calories. Uh, so roughly 80 calories per gel. So that was roughly about the same as a scoop of the, the he drink mix. Um, so if I'm drinking, so for example, if I have 80 calories in a scoop and I have two bottles, so that's two scoops, um, that gives me 160 calories. If I take in a gel, that gives me up to another 80, that gives me 240. So it's a way to kind of figure out how to get to, to, to the, the totals that you need. Um, again, we can look at sodium. So a little bit of a sodium here. Um, another product, we're, we're not going to spend too much time on, but, you know, we, we, we talked about nutrition before, during, and after. Um, it is important to, you know, we talked about carbohydrates. During is going to be your predominant fuel that you need to replace. Um, but after, it's important to not only take in the carbohydrates to, re, you know, fill up that tank again, um, but also to get in uh, some protein as well. So protein helping with, I'm sorry, protein's help, 
additional protein helps with protein synthesis, so basically allowing your body to make proteins and, and repair any muscle damage. Um, so creating your plan, and like I said, we'll make this available so you can, you can look at it. So I'm just going to kind of go through this real quick. Um, but I've, basically what I've done is broken mine into three different parts. Uh, so pre-race, so we talked about that, that need to, to fill up our tanks. Um, and, you know, one way to do that is, you know, two or three days before is to take in additional carbohydrates. So think about it as, you know, overloading the muscles so they're, they're going to soak up some more cal uh, carbohydrates. Um, day before, night before, you know, I'm kind of, I may be concerned with not having a lot of heavy stuff in my gut. So I would probably stay away from hamburgers and pizza on the day before and, you know, the night before, um, you know, taking in carbohydrates, but also making sure I'm getting some, some protein um, that's, you know, going to be digested and, and not sitting in my stomach for the next day. Um, three to four hours before, so waking up, if you're doing a 7 a.m. race, um, you may need to get up at four to eat. Um, so again, high carbohydrates to top off the, the carbohydrate stores and maybe a little protein, a little fat. Um, some things I, I like to eat, oatmeal with jam, you know, banana, uh, coffee, um, or peanut butter, jelly on bread, you know, banana or coffee. So things that are, you know, easily, easy to find, things I, I would train with or practice with beforehand, um, and then sip on a sports drink. Um, 60 to 15 minutes before, uh, just water, and then finally 15 minutes before, um, so that last little bit, um, a calories, carbohydrates, so sports drink, and either or water with um, a gel. Um, in race, um, so again, the goal here is, you know, you've started hopefully with a, a full tank of carbohydrates, so you're trying to, you know, stay hydrated as much as possible and, and maintain your, your uh, fuel levels. Um, so during a triathlon, the swim, you, you can't really do anything. Um, the bike, you know, for me, I, I generally found it takes about 15 to 20 minutes before things settle down, before I can eat or drink. Um, and then what I do, and you know, is basically about every 15 to 20 minutes, um, I want to take in my calories. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, so I, I use predominantly sports drink, but I'll also use gel. Um, and then I may need extra water. So if it's hot and humid, um, I may need additional water b beyond what's in you know, pre-mixed with my sports drink. And my goal, you know, for an Ironman, I'm, I'm targeting, you know, roughly around 300 calories per hour, so 70 grams per hour. Um, so, again, I'm going to have to get that from multiple uh, carbohydrate types or sugar types. Um, run, um, you know, it's, it's, it's harder to digest stuff. It's sitting in your stomach. So, I, you know, I like to stick mostly with liquids, so sports drink, water, um, but with the option for a gel or easily digestible food. So one thing I, you know, I like during a race is gummy bears. They, they seem to work for me. Um, and then supplement with extra electrolytes if needed. Um, again, you know, the, lot, the conditions are really going to drive the hydration and electrolyte needs. Um, the calories are going to be fairly consistent from one race distance, um, for one race distance. So this slide right here, this is really the meat of the presentation and, you know, the slide before this and the slide after this. You should have something like this sort of planned out and mapped out and follow it and implement it. I, you know, I can't drive that in enough. And if you're training and you're, you know, getting ready for your next half Ironman and you've already started sort of increasing your duration, you're out running for at least an hour, riding for two plus hours, you need to start mapping this out, write it down, practice with it, and follow it. So you know how your body reacts to it. And again, your body has to learn to assimilate this stuff to absorb it really well and tolerate it to have it work for you. Yeah, one, one trick, so I, I, I think there are a number of questions on, you know, I, I don't remember to eat or drink. Um, you can set, set your watch, you know, the alarm go off every 15, 20 minutes. Um, that's a good way uh, to, re to remind yourself. Um, and then finally, post-race, you know, really, you're just basically refueling the tank. So you, you're typically going to burn more and sweat more than you've been able to take in. 
So you want to replace that. Um, so you're getting that uh, so sodium, carbohydrates, um, and you know fluids as well as a little bit of, of protein as well. So that yeah, we attended a seminar and they talked about, they did a lot of research on protein for endurance athletes and strength training athletes, and the recommendations were very similar uh, based off of a lot of this research is that protein replacement, um, it was about 20 grams of protein multiple times throughout the day after training or racing um, is really important for recovery. So, you know, as an endurance athlete, we have to replace glycogen, but, you know, there's a recovery product or protein powder, you can get, um, you know, at least 10 grams plus if you mix milk or something else in that product, 20 grams of protein easily or a meal. And then basically every couple hours you want to replace that 20 grams of protein. And, you know, based on the research, your recovery the next day is better. So the glycogen is really important, especially if you're doing multiple sessions because you need those stores. And um, if you're not going to eat for long periods of time, the, the products are, are really nice for that. Yeah, and, and glycogen uh, carbohydrates. Um, yeah, and chocolate milk's a, a great recovery drink because you get, you get sugar, you get um, protein, and, and you get fluid. Yeah, and within, you know, the rule of thumb is like within 30 minutes, um, an hour at least, that you replace a lot of the stuff, the absorption rate's better. Um, so talk a little bit about training. You know, the bottom line is, you know, you're, you're, you're working hard, so you're, you're swimming, you're biking, you're running, or if you're a runner, you're just running. Um, but, you know, training it also means nutrition and hydration. So practicing, you know, especially as you're doing distances and efforts that are race-like. Um, so both are important. So if you're, you know, training for a shorter race like a sprint or an Olympic, you know, it's a higher intensity. Um, so when you're doing your higher intensity workouts, you know, practice, you know, as if it was in the race. Um, the same thing for your longer rides and runs. Um, you know, one great tool you can do use to measure water loss, um, and this is, you, you want to lose some, um, you don't want to gain weight. So gain weight we talked about is potentially bad because we're taking in too much water. Um, so there's a, a calculation you can use is basically weighing yourself before and after, and then um, that difference you can divide that by your before weight, it gives you a percent loss. Um, here, here's an example you, you can look at afterwards. Um, other things you can look at for hydration, uh, you want your urine to be uh, light like lemonade, um, and then if it's darker yellow like apple juice, it's a, it's a good chance you're dehydrated. Um, and you know, not only practice what you're using, but also practice logistics. So what you know what's available to you um you know if you're if you have aid stations every space so often um one thing i used to like to do for my long runs is i, I would do looped runs so i might have a i'm doing like a you know 12 mile long run i might do a four mile loop three times and i'll set up my little aid station uh, to stimulate stimulate that you know plan for that you know what's available you know if, if it's you know typically you'll see aid stations every mile on the run on the bike you know, generally every 10 to 15 miles, but it, you know, it may depend. So you know, just, you know, estimate how much time you'll have between and make sure, okay, do I have enough to get to that aid station or between aid stations? Um, you know, I like, you know, especially doing longer races, I typically start with a bottle of sports drink um, and I'll, I'll have a, a flask of gel. So I have something available. Um, so even if I don't get to that first aid station to 40 minutes into the race, you know, have something available, you know, 15, 20 minutes in once things settle down. You know, I don't know if we already said this, but don't try anything new on race day. Um, if your body hasn't practiced with it or used it before, you might be very disappointed on how you react. And race day. Um, so, again, very much a mental game, but there's also the, uh, the planning and preparation part. Um, follow your plan. Um, so, you, you know, you, in training, uh, you and one thing I've helped, it's really helped me, and it's sort of a visualization exercise as well, is to you know, write out your race as, as if you, how you want it to happen. So, you know, stepping through, you know, starting from, you know, leading up to the race, where you start, how you want to feel, um, you know, what you're eating and drinking, um, and write it down. I, I found it's really a helpful exercise because then 
as I go through it, I realize, oh, you know, shoot, I, you know, I forgot to put down electrolytes or, gosh, you know, I, you know, there's 30 miles between eight stations. I may need something more, um, you know, in between than, than just, you know, one bottle. So it helps to write, write this stuff down. Um, final tips, you know, like I said, I like to start with something. Uh, don't try anything new. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, you know, there's, I, you know, back in the day um, when I was in Endurox, it was something like, it was Endurox or something like Endurox came out and it was, uh, you know, the, the, you know, protein and, you know, the four to one carbohydrate protein was sort of the new thing. And that was in a gel. And I remember, you know, so I was like, I'm going to try this. And, you know, it worked great for me in training. Um, but when I got to race day, when I was doing an Olympic race, I, I just, it, it just upset my stomach and I, I threw it all up. So, that, you know, the challenge is even though you train with it, 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 you may still have a different reaction on race day. So just be, warn, you know, be wary of that and, you know, realize that, you know, racing itself is, is going to be part of the learning curve. Um, be flexible. I mean, there will be times out there where my goal is, okay, I, wanna, I need to take in 300 calories, but I, maybe I can't because my stomach's upset or, you know, I just, you know, I just can't stomach it right now. Um, so maybe I, I, you know, I take in 240. Um, you know, keep moving. You know, I say you never get to the finish line by standing still and then, of, of course, have fun. Now go achieve your success. So I, I love this quote by Edmund Hillary, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. So thank you. Uh, this concludes the formal presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll post the recording at enduranceworks.net slash resources. Um, our next webinar in two weeks, we'll get more into daily nutrition habits. Uh, so we're not going to talk about a specific diet per se because there's, there's, you know, a thousand different diets out there. But really what are seven things you can do each day that will lead to a better, healthier body. And that actually works with a number of, of different um, diet strategies. And there, we, we did have one question. I, I'm not sure if I answered it, but it, it, the question was, what are your thoughts about eat your carbs, drink your electrolytes? Um, you know, I, I like I like to drink my carbs and then maybe supplement a little bit of eating, um, just because it, I found it's more easily digestible for me. Um, and then electrolytes, yeah, they're generally going to be you 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 want to even if you're taking like uh, capsules, you're going to need to be taking them with fluids. Um, there is a product out there called the the right stuff, uh, which is actually a li a liquid. It comes in these little vials. It's like sort of like a brine solution if it's really salty. Um, but you can actually just dump that right into your bottle um, or something like noon tablets um, that dissolve as well. The other thing um, a couple of my clients like to do is take the salt stick tabs or um, any of those salt stick capsules and open them up and sort of mix them within your product, whether it's heat or something else. Um, so if you don't like to worry about swallowing those and you've got your little cocktail of, you know, sodium to fluid to carbohydrate ratios in your water bottle, Maybe that's easier for you too. But different combinations work for people differently. And, you know, again, you want to try out, um, you know, what, what you think works best for you. And if you think it's not working, you, you know, you might want to change it a little bit with a little bit more, um, you know, of eating the carbohydrates versus drinking or vice versa. Yes. Yeah, some may, maybe just what you feel like at the time. Like, I, I like, gummy bears, you know, during my, bi my bike and sometimes even during the run, during a race, just because it's, it's something different. It's a different texture. It's a different taste than, you know, than taking gels all the time. Um, one thing I, 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 you know, I hate getting a gel out on the course that I don't like. Um, like I, I don't, you know, I, I really don't want ca the caffeine or, you know, I don't really like chocolate or espresso gel during my race. Um, so in that case, you know, for the, you know, I may pick up the drink from the course, but I'll actually carry like a flask of, you know, whatever gel flavor I, I you know, I, that I like. Um, if you all have questions, uh, please ask them via the chat window. Um, we do have all the questions that came in before the webinar, so we can, we can run th through those as well. 
Um, it was a good question about hot and humid events. Um, that's tough. I mean, I is it Ken wrote love starburst coming out of the ocean. Yeah, so starburst. That's another. Uh, you know, find something you like, you look forward to. Um, to get, it gets old, you know, if you're 12, 14 hours into a race and you're you're eating the same thing over and over. Um, so hot and humid events. And, and this actually, uh, you know, one thing to think about, and I've kind of gone over this with a number of athletes this year who are racing in Boulder and the Ironman, um, and I'll say adjustments for hot, humid, and altitude, is, you know, if you're – in a perfect world, you want to race where you live because that's the conditions you'll experience. Um, in a not so perfect world, close to ideal, um, you, you, one strategy is to pick races that are similar conditions. Um, I know for me, when I did Coeur d'Alene in, in 2010, uh, the altitude is not that much. I think it's like 3,000 feet, um, but it was pretty dry. So when I was coming from, you know, I was living on the East Coast, so. Uh, Baltimore, near Baltimore at the time, um, and coming to a drier climate, it, I, I didn't realize I was getting dehydrated because I, I just wasn't used to that low humidity. Um, and it, you know, it, I did great on the bike, and then you know, come to the run, I was like, whoa, you know, it, it was almost too late. Um, you know, so the extent that you, you know, it, it's tough, and you may need to adjust. And you know, from in my case, I, you know, I should have done a better job hydrating before. Um, you know, day, day, you know, day or two before and, and during as well. Um, you know, and there's the general guideline for, you know, calories is, uh, you know, for carbohydrates is like 6 to 8% um, solution, you know. So, you know, what can your body, you know, uh, absorb, really absorb? Um, you know, so in my case, you know, I, I probably had enough calories, so I would need to, I should have taken in additional water with, with probably electrolytes as well to, to account for the, the sweating. Yeah, and one of the things you could do with training, if, especially if you don't get, if it's cold and you're, you're training for these hotter humid events, if you train indoors and you're sweating more um, and replacing, you know, fluids, calories, electrolytes through that sweat loss, you're, you're training sort of for the heat a little bit more. Um, and you're learning to assimilate all those different products as well. So that could be helpful. It might be a little torturous if you do some long sessions, but you would acclimate, you know, a little bit. So maybe once a week or, or something for your, you know, run or your, in your ride. And there was a question I, I can't find. I, can't, I don't see it right now, but it was um, regarding, you know, something that, you know, somebody that you don't want to take in something sweet, but you get the calories. Um, pure maltodextrin doesn't have any flavor, um, and there's a product out there called Carbo Pro that's just maltodextrin, so you can get the calories, but but not the sweetness. Um, so there there are pro you know products like that out there. And and you can buy, you can actually purchase maltodextrin, um, you know, just by itself. But yeah, the Carbo Pro is great. A lot of people like that. It's got some other things in it, but it doesn't have, like David said, the added sweeteners. Our salt has a, a good supplement. Um, I, you know, I think if the condition, if it's hot or humid, um, you're more more than likely going to need them. And there's different products out there. So we, we showed Enduralites and Noon Tablets. Um, some of the other products that have a higher sodium are a salt stick and uh, lava salts. Yeah, and I think they're great, um, you know, because in these longer distance events, you're obviously – losing more fluid and more sodium through the sweat. And we talked about the dangers of hyponatremia. So it's really good if you don't use um, salt sticks and your products don't have a lot of sodium and you're going long or you're going intensely for long periods to sit down and, and map out, okay, I've got this much fluid. Like we put some of the examples of American College of Sports Medicine, you know, says, you know, 500 milligrams of sodium per 500 milliliters, I think, in that. 32 ounces. Th or 32 ounces of fluid. So if you have a big water bottle and you've got two salt stick um, caps, that's five, um, the 500 milligrams of, of sodium right there when you finish that bottle of water. And if you do have sodium already in your, your um, product, you may not need two salt stick caps. Um, is there a question? Any thoughts about base? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. Or, or you? 
Oh, is that is that a product? I'm not familiar. Oh, new, so new product. You know, I I'm not familiar with it. I have to definitely. I'm going to write that down and look that up. I always like to uh, learn about new products and what's in them because a lot of times, you know, there's people out there utilizing it, and I want to you know be educated on what's in it. So I will definitely look that up. There's another uh, question that came in earlier uh, about Tailwind. I guess it's another product. Tailwind. Um, yeah, and if um, yeah, if you want to email us later about those things, I'll definitely, you know, see what I can find out about that. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is, you know, what the ingredient list is and the types of sugars. The um, when I was doing a talk last night, somebody mentioned, you know, taking Gatorade, and somebody else said, well, isn't that bad for you? And you know, one of the things like a product like Gatorade has is, you know, these artificial dyes. So if, you know, you want to consider what's, what's in that. Um, we like Hammer products because, you know, they're, they're not artificial as, you know, the artificial dyes are not in there. Yeah. Um, this is a good question. Does front-loading the bike with proteins or fat make a difference to an Ironman? And so, you know, really as part of your day-to-day -day nutrition, um, you need the carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. Um, but really, I mean, during a race, unless you're talking about multiple days, um, so like an adventure race over a week, um, then, you know, protein and fat become a, an important fuel source. Um, but for most of what we're doing, it's really front-loading with um, carbohydrates. And again, if you go back to that earlier chart, you, you, there, there is a, we all have a lot of fat stores available. Um, so those calories are available. Um, you know, and same with protein. Um, we, we, you know, we want to burn fat. I mean, that's, that's our goal, right? Um, we don't want to burn protein because that's breaking down the body. Um, but they're not going to, we're not, probably not going to run out of them, or we're not going to run out of them, I'll say, in, in you know, a, a one-day event. Um, it's just when you start getting into multi-day events that, that might um, become an issue. And, you know, regarding protein, I, you know, I, I've, I've, not, I've talked to a number of folks that have really had success using, um, you know, drinks, sport, uh, carbo, you know, sports drinks with protein. Um, I, I know for me personally, I, I, I just, you know, I could, I did fine with training, but as soon as I, you know, did like a real high intensity effort, it, it just upset my stomach and, you know, I, I get sick. Yeah, the other thing with the protein sports drinks is if it's hot, and they're sitting out, the protein can spoil. So that's happened in some cases, or somebody's gotten sick from that. So if, you now one of my clients liked a product with protein in it, a hammer product, Perpetuum. So what we did for the first part of her race is use that at the beginning, and then she had heed, because as it got warmer throughout the day, there's no protein in heed, it's just maltodextrin, it didn't spoil, so she's using that later on. Um, this is a good question on, uh, on advice on better fueling on the go, and yeah, I think the big thing here and in, in, um, is really sort of laying things out the the day before, the night before. So if you if you know, you know, you're going to be in the office all day and you're going to run out to do a workout of lunch, is you know, bringing you know, you know, having food available, um, you know, bring it with you. And and I know Chris is big on this because we'll, we'll do a workout and if she's low on calories. She, she's, she gets in a very bad mood. <laughs> so I try to remind her um, to bring snacks with her. Yeah, I, um, I think the next webinar we do will help a lot because we go through, like, different snacks and, you know, good choices. Um, but, you know, on the go, it's, it's really important to, to know, like, the night before even, okay, I'm going to do this workout or multiple workouts and I'm going to be pretty busy really should plan out either your meals or your snacks. Um, and if you have to bring some bars or, a, you know, a shake, pre-make that or have that available, those things can be really helpful. Like those Recoverite packets, I always have some handy because I know after a workout, if I don't have something, at least I can mix that in my water bottle and I'm getting something in my system quick and I'm not as cranky, so we're tolerable. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and one thing, um, if you go back to the analogy of having a fuel tank of carbohydrates, that, that gets depleted when you work out. And even if you don't work out, you know, if you, 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 know, if you, 
you get you can get low blood sugar. So it's important to kind of you know may, be be aware of that. So if you're doing you know especially as a triathlete, you know we might be doing two workouts a day, sometimes even three. Um, that that effect can be cumulative. So for you know if I'm if I swim with masters Saturday morning for example and do a bike ride afterwards, you know I'm going to deplete some of that carbohydrates at the end of the swim. Um, so it, you know, one thing to consider is, you know, if you find yourself on that bike ride getting tired and, you know, just running low energy, it may, you may need to, you know, consider taking in, um, you know, stuff right after the swim or during the swim um, so that you, you, you have those carbohydrate stores available. Yeah, and remember, like, if you're doing a lot of volume and you're doing long distance events and training on a daily basis, your calorie, your metabolic rate is probably higher. You're burning a lot. So even easier workouts, you might need to use a, you know, bottle of Carbo Pro um, just to kind of refuel. So if you're bonking even during short, easy sessions, it, you know, you could be um, needing a little bit more, more glycogen and, and hydration. Uh, this is a great question. Uh, recommendations for those who have a sensitive gut and often have issues on the run with bloating, absorption of food and fluids. Um, so a, going back to one of the previous slides, um, what the research has shown is that, you know, things that can, are harder to absorb are going to be your, 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 your fats, uh, fiber, um, protein, and concentrated carbohydrates. And I, I know in my experiences as an Ironman athlete um, back in, you know, 2002, 2003 time period, I was taking in too concentrated, too much carbohydrates. So my, it would just basically collect in my gut and get bloated. Um, but as soon as I threw it up, um, I, I feel a lot better. Um, so, you know, look at what you're eating. Um, you know, during the bike, you can typically get away with eating more solid foods like bars. Um, you know, I you know, used to take in power bars during the bike. Um, it, it's a lot harder on the run. Um, so it's, in my own experiences, you know, I typically stick mostly with fluids and then, um, you know, every, every once in a while a gel. Yeah, if, um, if you have any more information on where I can find a more about base, I, I did a search and, and couldn't locate it. So, Ken, if you have any, uh, or, you know, you can always email me too, but I'll, I'll do a little bit more research. Okay, thanks. Um, this is another good question. What is the best pre-race food to take? And, you know, one thing is that when you think about pre-race, actually think about, um, not just the morning of, but also the day before. So, you know, again, you know, taking in a little bit extra carbohydrates, uh, I think the research has shown up to like um, 10 grams per kilogram of body weight, um, which can be a lot. Um, but really, you know, foods you're comfortable with, and, you know, like I try and stay away from the heavy pastas with cream sauce and, um, you know, anything with a lot of fat. Um, I mean, you know, it's Pre-race, you know, the day before, I mean, you know, definitely, you know, have some fat in your diet, have some protein, um, but, you know, probably most of us, you, you don't don't need to go load up on pasta either. Um, so, again, you don't need a big heavy meal that's just going to, you know, sit in your stomach. Um, Megan asks, is there a good place to get hammer products in, in bulk for a good deal? Wow, um, that's a good question. I I know as a race director, they, they used to provide products to, for the races. Um, you, know, you can you can order directly on the website. I'm not sure. You know, sometimes if you can find like a performance bike or, or somebody that sells them, they'll put them on sale. And it, you know, yeah, the one thing with a lot of these nutrition products um, is, is they get expensive. Um, you know, over the long haul. Um, so yeah, I guess anytime you, you can you can find stuff on sale is is good. Yeah, I I think um, you know through your local shops if they sell the products and give discounts and um, you know if you have a team or a group you're with sometimes the clubs you know if they're associated with a the shop they'll provide a discount. But um, you know like we were talking about maltodextrin and, and heat is basically maltodextrin flavored, you can get that in bulk, um, pretty inexpensive, and, you know, utilize that, mix it with water. Yeah, I, I have a 
probably six or seven years ago, I bought, bought like, I think it was like a 100 pound bag of maltodextrin. <laughs> so it looked like this, maybe it was 50 pounds. So it looked like this big bag of dog food, but it was maltodextrin. And that, that lasted about a year. So I think it was like 100 bucks. Um, so there, there's options like that. Um, yeah, and, you know, definitely I think clubs get discounts. Uh, you can also look at being a sponsored athlete. So a lot of these companies, you know, you don't necessarily have to be the fastest athlete. Um, in many cases, they're looking for good brand ambassadors. So if you can, if you, you're passionate about the product and you can, you know, you'll wear their clothing and you'll, you'll blog about it, post on a Facebook, um, that, that's another option. Um, I know for, for us, it, you know, we, we, we've had um, relationships with a number of companies, you know, Hammer being one of them, um, you know, just, just Soto Sports another, um, where if you can build a relationship with them, uh, you, can, you can often get stuff at significant discount. Yeah, thanks for that website based performance dot com. I'm looking through that stuff. Um, is it are there any other, other questions? You know, I, I really think that um one of the uh most important things to remember about you know, your your training and racing is that it's it's everything to keep your body in homeostasis and that requires you know a proper hydration nutrition plan and I, I can't tell you how many times I have an athlete come to me and you know say they're not feeling good their performance is going down and ask them about their nutrition and hydration and they say well yeah I'm doing this I'm, I'm doing everything correctly and then we actually write it out and implement you know these things and get the right amounts and it changes their world and all of a sudden their training feels better, their recovery is better, you know, post-workout recovery um, products, again, are great, but, you know, just practicing and implementing, and on race day, they do really well, and, you know, like I said at the beginning of this pre presentation, your nutrition hydration plan can make or break you, and it, it really is a big thing, and um, I'm really glad that you guys are on this webinar and you're, you're um, focused on it. And um, I think that will, you know, give you a lot of success in your racing. Cool. Well, thank you again for attending. Uh, please contact us with any questions or comments. Um, we do have the next webinar is actually um, one we're, we're really passionate about because um, it's really sort of, you know, nutrition is everything. So it's really how do you, you know, day in, day out, be better, healthier, and that that will translate into athletic performance as well. Um, but the goal with it is not to say you have to eat this and that, but really to give you, okay, here's some guidelines, um, some practices, some habits um, that you can implement, um, you know, for any type of, you know, diet that you have now, whether, you know, if you're vegetarian, you know, if you are just eat fish, um, you know, these, these, these habits or these principles um, will apply as well. Yeah, and we'll talk about eating on the go a little more and, and what, you know, things you should consider, um, you know, in, in different types of foods that might work well for you. And um, Ken, if you want to shoot me an email, I'm just going to review some of that product information more and get, um, I'll get back to you if, you if you email me a little later. And, you know, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. As always, if you have questions, send us an email. And um, we do have um, a lot of resources on our website, Endurance Works. So you can check that out. And um, this webinar will go up there. And, you know, we will uh, look forward to hopefully having you join us for the, the daily nutrition habits because this sort of – these, I, I feel like these two presentations, this next one and this, this one we just did, really um, kind of, you know, sink a little bit. So you'll, you know, pick up more information on training nutrition from this next one as well. Yep. And um, as I said, we've recorded this, so I will, um, I should have it up sometime tomorrow, and I'll send out an email to everyone. But at, at the latest, um, I'll have it have it up by. Uh, Thursday, and we'll send you a link to the presentation, 
Uh, you can either download it or just view it online um, as, as well as the recording. So you definitely check out the presentation and some of the, those guidelines, slides, um, you know, and use them as a guideline, you know, as a starting point um, and, you know, sort of tweak it from there. And, you know, it, it's I always, I always think of, you know, a triathlon, especially Ironman is sort of this big, you know, puzzle piece, all these pieces, and it's, you know, trying to fit all the pieces together and make it work. And it's, it's, it's part of the, the, for me, part of the allure and the excitement of, okay, how do I figure this out? And, you know, it, it took me, it took me a number of races, you know, to kind of nail things. But then, you know, even after that, I, I still find myself making mistakes. So, always a learning experience. Yeah, and not, and not just the longer events, but even the shorter events. I work with some people and, and figured out some things and, you know, sprints, Olympic distance. It, it's still pretty, pretty important for those as well. Yep. Great. Thanks, and uh, have a good night. Thanks, everyone.